Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about physical computing. The idea that you can use physical systems, physical devices to perform computing operations. Now, the computers that you generally use are digital computers and they implement all the computational circuitry. For example, the ability to add numbers, subtract numbers, multiply them, the ability to compare numbers. All of these types of computational elements are implemented in silicon. And then, of course, we have higher level abstractions like programming languages that make use of the physical infrastructure, the gates, the transistors, the switches that exist within this silicon infrastructure. And we use digital means to communicate with and program these devices. But this isn't the only type of computation that's possible. And in fact, going back to 60, 70 BC, the Antikythera mechanism, which was a Greek invention, a mechanical system made of gears, was designed to compute location, to compute the locations of stars, and to be used as a navigational aid. We don't exactly know all of the operations that the Antikythera mechanism provided to its users, but it was a breakthrough uh, in being able to use mechanical gears and systems to compute things that were useful to human beings. Now, that's not where this ended. In fact, Antikythera mechanism inspired a whole line of types of computers that were all analog, that were based on gears and mechanisms. And going back to the Umayyad dynasty in Spain, there were many breakthroughs in astrolab technology, which were, again, derivatives of and advancements over the Antikythera mechanism. The Arab rulers in uh, Muslim Spain used this technology for navigation to predict the locations of stars and, and therefore to have some idea of where they were um, and also predict time and uh, uh, identify seasons and, and things of that nature. Now, this technology actually going back to the 1200s was quite uh, breathtaking and there were some mechanical breakthroughs such as extremely thin brass parts that were used in these uh, astrolabes, including those that were thinner than two millimeters. And at that time, it was very hard to create parts of this precision. It turns out that those parts weren't actually created anywhere in Spain. And when you trace where those parts originated from, it turns out that they originated from what is now modern day Pakistan, the city of Lahore. Um, and here in Lahore, there was an entire industry that was manufacturing analog computers. In fact, there was the famous uh, family of uh, a man called Alladad, who during the time of the Emperor Humayu in around the 1500s, created a small industry that was actually exporting these computers all over the world. So that's to tell you a little bit about the history of mechanical computers. These computers uh, predate digital systems and were actually used in the ancient world for numerous useful purposes. Now, if you think about analog computing and if you think about physical computing, it's possible to see that in action even today. And in some cases, it actually has advantages over digital computers. Now, I'll give you three examples of physical computers that you can build or that you can use today that should get you going in terms of the potential for this technology and in terms of the curiosity associated with identifying where all computation is at play. So the first example I'll give you is that of a water-based averaging machine. Now, imagine a series of tubes, vertical tubes, that have water levels indicated through a gauge on each one of these tubes. And at the base of these tubes, there's a valve that connects all of the tubes together through a system of pipes or a reservoir. And you can close the valve such that the water would be maintained independently in the tube. And if you open the valve, all of the tubes would be connected through the, through the reservoir and it would become one body of water. Now let's imagine this system initially with all the valves closed. And let's say we have 10 of these tubes. We indicate the 
value the number that we want to put into the tube in order to average the numbers because this is going to be an averaging machine that's going to use the water in order to perform the computation. So we start off with placing uh, different water levels in each one of these tubes, let's say uh, two centimeters or uh, uh, four centimeters or six centimeters above the base level of the tube. And because all the valves are closed right now, each one of the water levels is preserved individually in the tube. Now suddenly, when you open all the valves, the water meets with the reservoir, meets with the system of tubes, and the water will essentially go down to the same level. So as the water becomes part of this common body of water, all of the individual levels in the tubes come down to the average of the values in each tube. So if you had, for example, two and four and six, these values will become four, which is the average value. And this will happen in an instant. And the interesting thing to think about here is that no matter how many tubes you have, this averaging will be happening in parallel. And it's, it's no longer going to take more time to do this average, no matter how many tubes you have. So you've sort of delinked this averaging computation from any kind of a serial process. It's all happening in parallel. It's all happening in constant time. Or in computer science, for those of you who are familiar, in what's called big O of K, where K is a fixed number. So it's the, the order of the computation is a fixed order. So that's one example this water-based system to do averaging. Let me give you another example, which is the abacus. Now, many of you are familiar with the abacus, which was invented in China. Uh, and through ancient times, this device, which is essentially made up of a system of rods and balls, uh, this is used for computation. And each tear on the abacus can be used to denote, for example, an order of magnitude. Now, the reason why I wanted to provide this example to you is to expose the nature of the mechanical elements of computation. Now, the abacus, unlike the water machine that I described earlier, doesn't actually do anything on its own. Human locomotion, human movement, human manipulation is required in order to perform a computation. However, when you're adding, subtracting, multiplying numbers on an abacus, you don't really need to know how the computation works. Once you encode a number positionally with different beads moved to the left or the right side of the abacus, then when you perform an addition or a multiplication operation, all you're doing is repeating certain mechanical actions over and over again in order to get to the right answer. You don't actually have to do the math in your head. So in that sense, repetitive mechanical manipulation is causing a complex computation to materialize in a physical system, a system of balls and rods, the abacus. So this is the second example that I want to give you of a physical machine that can be used for computation. The third example that I want to give you is something related to maps and identifying uh, the most convenient, closest location to multiple points on a map. Now, you might think of this um, in digital terms, think of this as sort of Google Earth. You load up a map and then you can take two or three points and you can plot the distances and you perform some computation and you can, you can know what the center point, which is equidistant from n number of other points on the map is. But as you can see on a computer, this would require either the writing of some code or some other built-in feature in GIS or mapping software. But now let's think about solving this problem through a physical computer. And in order to do this, imagine a table which has a map on it. Now you've got lots of cities, lots of places on this map. We, what we want to do is we want to take three or four of these locations and automatically find the optimal midpoint between multiple of these locations. And we don't want to measure and go through any kind of math in our head in order to do this. 
or use um, geometric instruments to do this. We just want to have a very simple mechanism that will perform the computation and give us the optimal midpoint between any number of cities. What we want to do is we want to have a very optimal and easy mechanical mechanism that will give us uh, the ability to identify this midpoint between multiple cities or multiple points on the map. Now, in order to do this, imagine drilling holes through, let's say, the three locations for which you want to find a midpoint. And now taking strings of equal length and tying them together at one end. So basically, at one end, you have these three strings tied together. And now you take the other end of the string and you pass that through the holes in the table. And at the other end of the string, which again, all the strings are equidistant, you attach weights. These weights are also equal. And so what happens is the weights via gravity pull the string in such a way that the center of the string automatically stops at the point which is equidistant from all three of the cities. So you're essentially using gravity to do this computation for you. Now you can actually adapt this in some interesting ways. Um, here we're using equal weights because we want to assume that the cost of traveling uh, an equal amount of a distance is the same cost. But let's say one of these cities is in hilly terrain. You can actually adjust the weights so that the point that's calculated is not just equidistant, but is equal in some sense of cost. And each one of the weights uh, we use this term in artificial intelligence and neural networks, but there we think of the weight just as a number um, in software, in a data structure. But here, it's a literal weight. It's something that's weighing down the string. And you can adapt that weight so that the computation that then occurs is going to find you an optimal point on the map, taking into account the different cost or the different um, importance of any one of these locations. So these are three examples of mechanical computers that you can build, try on your own, and see how physical systems perform computation around us all the time. We've gotten used to thinking of computers as digital systems that run complex computations in silicon, but really computers are all around us. And once you have your eyes open to this fact, uh, there's lots of potential for invention. There's lots of potential for satisfying curiosity. There's lots of potential to learn about the nature of computation via mechanical systems that show us how it all works.